Uh, when we all know that uh, the, historic, the historic land of Carpathian Rus uh, is, uh, is divided at the present time uh, between uh, several countries, in particular Poland, Slovakia, Ukraine, and Romania, and that there are also, of course, Rusins living in northeastern Hungary uh, and in the diasporas, uh, as we, the term used today, or the immigration in Serbia, Croatia, and, and of course the large group here in North America. A key year, a wonderful year, a year that we all experienced, was the year 1989, one of the greatest years, not only of the 20th century, because it really brought to a close the disastrous 20th century, or the short 20th century that began in 1914 with all of the destruction of World War I, the interwar dictatorships, the destruction of World War II, and then the domination of communist rule throughout Central and Eastern Europe finally came to a close uh, in 1989. And as a result of that, a group of people, our people, living in the homeland, completely and totally cut off from us or us from them because of the policies of the revolutionary, forward-looking, progressive-looking Soviet Union, started to unravel first with the fall of the Iron Curtain in late 1989, and then, of all things, the disintegration of the Soviet Union two years later. As a result of those epochal events, the greatest revolution since the French Revolution, literally 200 years before, our people, which we now very well and clearly know are Carpathian Russians, uh, had the opportunity to express themselves once again. A nationality that was banned, a language that was banned, was now given the opportunity once again in countries that hope to be democratic uh, to, come in, to, to come into re-existence, if you will. Not to come into existence, but come, to come into re-existence. And uh, three basic things occurred during the period since the revolutions of 1989 until the present. And those three kind of goals of, if we will, the Carpathian Rusin revival since 1989, were first to be recognized within each country where they lived as a distinct people, not as a branch of somebody else, whether it be Slovak or Polish or Ukrainian or Russian, but as a people unto itself and living in countries all of which by definition were multinational, so that the countries themselves came to realize and did come to realize that there's a concrete difference between citizenship and national and ethnic identity. Everyone who lives in the Czech Republic is a citizen of the Czech Republic. Everyone who lives in Slovakia is a citizen of Slovakia. But that doesn't mean that everyone who lives in Slovakia, or for that matter Ukraine, is of Slovak or Ukrainian nationality. Why? Because these countries, like most countries of the world, are multinational. They have different nationalities. Many of those countries hope to make them all into one, but certainly in the democratic movement after 1989, Slovakia is a multinational country. No one's going to tell Magyars or Roma that they are Slovaks. Right? They're Slovak citizens, but they're not Slovaks by nationality and ethnicity. And so too we have Carpathian Rusins living in Slovakia and Ukraine as well. This question of recognition of Carpathian Rusins as a distinct nationality was achieved in every country where they live since the revolution of 1989 with the exception, or I will say more precisely partially, Because in these three points that I'm making, Ukraine is the exception. So, 
recognition of nationality, achieved in all countries except partially, not in Ukraine. The next thing was, along with recognition, was state support for the cultural endeavors of each of the nationalities within those states, including Carpeta Rus. If they're recognized as an official nationality, then they have a right to state support from, for their cultural endeavors, whether those are publications, whether those are theaters, whether those are organizations of various kinds, schools most importantly, radio, etc., etc., etc. And in each of those countries, actually, since Carpetho Russians are recognized officially as a nationality within those countries, they receive funding from the state for their cultural activities and educational activities. Again, the exception here is which country? Ukraine. Now, I also would have to say about Ukraine here uh, that, uh, well, let me, let me go to the third point and then I'll, I'll explain the Ukrainian exception in each of the three points. So the third area was that in each of the countries where Carpathian Russians lived after 1989, their demands, their primary demands, were for, uh, were cultural in nature. That is recognition of Carpathian Russians as a distinct nationality and also support for their cultural endeavors, not political. Of course, as some of us know, just mention the name Carpathian Russians, that's, that's already a political act. <laughs> but, okay. Uh, uh, th their demands were not for self rule, a separate country administrative autonomy, but just for recognition, codification of language, introduction of it in schools, etc., etc., etc. Again, the one exception was Ukraine, because the, Ukraine, the, the Carpetho Rusin community in Ukraine was different from Carpetho Rusin communities in other countries, and different in which way the Carpetho Rusins there also started off with cultural demands, but then very soon went into political demands. We once had autonomy, certainly for the longest time, officially, during, on the Czechoslovakia, during the interwar years, various other, and so we want autonomy again. So this was really an open political demand, different from Carpathian Russian communities in all the other countries. Now, comment on each of, the ex each of the three points and the exceptionalism uh, of uh, Ukraine. Uh, first of all, when I said Carpathian Russians were recognized in all countries except one, Ukraine, where they're not recognized. That is actually not true anymore, uh, because after a lot of work on the part of the Carpathian Russian community in Ukraine, and their brethren outside of Ukraine, whether in all of the countries, through the instrument of the World Congress of Rusins, and certainly among American Rusins, uh, uh, Carpeta Rusins, who have lobbied with governments, etc. Uh, in the end, technically, Carpeta Rusins are recognized in Ukraine because on March 7, 2007, March 7, 2007, the local regional assembly, elected regional assembly, voted 72 of the deputies, 72 to 2, uh, to recognize Carpathian Rusins, Rusins as a distinct nationality on the territory of their responsibility, the Transcarpathian Oblast of Ukraine, and then subsequently to demand that the central government recognize them at a national level. That decree is still in force today. So technically, Carpathian Rusins are recognized in Ukraine, but only on the territory of Transcarpathia. The next thing was, but not on the national level, and the national level is still the, they're still considered a branch of Ukrainians and so forth. And, so forth. and that has an impact. I mean, if you ask questions, I'll answer what the impact is. Uh, the second thing that happened was, totally unbeknownst to us, total surprise, 
was that during the Yanukovych regime, you, you've heard about Yanukovych, he was the president that was overthrown. Uh, responding to pressure from the Russian nationality and Russian speakers in Ukraine, passed a new language law. In August 2012, in August 2012, passed the language law. And as part of that language law is a question of what's going to be, is it going to have two languages official of Ukraine? You're going to have one language as official of Ukraine, but recognize regional languages. And that's supposed to, the second one was supposed to be Russian. They didn't go so far. They, made, they raised the prestige of Russian as a regional language of Ukraine. But it, there were other regional languages of Ukraine, and so in this language law, they actually, actually have a list of what other recognized languages in Ukraine, according to this law, which isn't still in force to this day. 14 languages. Lo and behold, what's one of them that comes up as one of the 14 Rusin? So you get this kind of paradoxical situation where the Rusin language, as a language, is recognized at the national level, but not the nationality. <laughs> Okay, it's Ukraine, East Slavs, we know, we know what that, we're, we're all this way, nothing can be totally logical because then we wouldn't be who we are, we would be Lutherans down the street or Germans or something. Uh, and we'd be less interesting. Banish it from our sight and from our ears. Uh, so, what's the present day situation? Well, first of all, we know that Ukraine is a state, now I'm focusing on Ukraine as one of those four places, because that's the subject of today. So it became independent in 1991. And since that time, it went through through two revolutions. Uh, one revolution uh, in 2004-2005, this was fam world famous, literally, called the Orange Revolution. That was an internal revolution, actually, about political, about a vote. And they were successful in overturn the corruption of a vote for a president. But then, five, seven years later, the president who got overthrown got elected legally. And he was this Yanukovych who became very uh, oriented toward Russia, of course, being Ukraine, and if you think Rusins don't make decisions, Ukraine you know, are, are specialists in not making decisions about anything. And so they didn't want to choose either the East or the West, you know, either what, the European Union or Russia. We, we, we'll do something in between. We'll be part of them and part of them. Well, it doesn't work. And uh, the present ruler of Russia, as you know, Vladimir Putin, uh, couldn't stand this uh, indecisiveness. Uh, demanded that uh, this president not make any deals with the West and not, be, not sign an agreement with the European Union, leading to a revolution in the streets, uh, the so-called Maidan of 2013-2014, overthrew uh, the Yanukovych government that fled, put it in a provisional government, and now has a normal government. And the upshot of that was the ally in the East, Putin didn't like this, and first illegally annexed a piece of territory of Ukraine, the Crimea, and then gave support to uh, rebels, if you will, in the Far East. Ukraine is at war. This is a country now at war. With regard to Transcarpathia, which is in this country now at war, you wouldn't know it's at war. Because obviously, as you well know, I mean, you can have something going on someplace, but doesn't touch you. So similarly, Transcarpathia in particular, and virtually all of Western and Central Ukraine, this includes Kiev. Everything is normal. I mean, you know, you, you, you have absolutely no clue that there's a war going on in this country. And in fact, the only clue is, is a degree of body bags, uh, or wounded young men because there are young men serving on the, in the Ukrainian army on the Eastern Front from Transcarpathia. 
So you, you walk the streets of Transcarpathia and it's completely normal, but the people of Transcarpathia, the mothers, the fathers of children, including, uh, including Valeri, who has a 21-year-old son and therefore is you know, suspect to the, open to the draft, or my colleague here said he, uh, Dr. Sergei Belenki, who's still young enough, he's from Kiev, carries a Ukrainian passport and subject to the draft to go fight on the Eastern Front. So these are real things. Uh, but you wouldn't notice it on the streets. So in that sense, Ukraine and the West is a relatively a safe place, including as much as Kiev. But it is a country at war. And what's then the relationship to the Russian question of being a country at war? The biggest danger to Ukraine today is what? It's not only one land was annexed by Russia, but in the eastern part of the country, we have so-called separatists, that is, the degree to which they represent the local population on the one hand, or from out, that's a question, that's a bait, but clearly they do not want, that, that movement is a separatist movement to break away from Ukraine. Hence the word separatism is the worst word that can be used to identify anybody in Ukraine today. Because it, it implies that you're working against this country, which is a war. And unfortunately, among activists, very few in Transcarpathia, very few in number, but as we well know, he or she who opens his mouth the loudest gets the most attention. And so there is actually one guy who has proclaimed himself Prime Minister of the Republic of Subcarpathian Rus. He's been living in Moscow for I don't know how long. And he's proclaiming that, you know, the Republic of Subcarpathian Rus is going to be recognized by Russia. It's going to separate from Ukraine. Of course, on the one hand, we can all laugh at this. This is silly. So, so he's sitting in Moscow making these declarations. Of course, Moscow is Moscow, which is the country that happens to be at war with Ukraine, and which promotes through Russian media at the international level these demands. What does that mean? Mention Kapitol Rusins in Ukraine to all separatists. So many of the demands that were moving forward slowly, systematically, you now have a block against. When we, for instance, meet with officials of the Ukrainian government as we have, individually as a group, with, with uh, representatives of the US government, whether it's in Ukraine, where we were a month ago, whether it's in Washington, it's been going on and we're going to be there the day after next. First question, <laughs> it's not, what are the cultural demands of Kapita Rusins, or what do they want? Or no, you know, how strong is the separatist movement? So, problem created by some of our own. Because, as I say, questions of autonomy, separatism, dangerous. Uh, recognition of nationality, I've already mentioned. There have been some achievements. Still working on having it done at the national level. The cultural demands in Ukraine, they have been up and down. Uh, had a school system funded by donors in North America. Traditional way of helping the homeland. Carpetho Rusins did it too, and we have been, or we were fortunate enough to attract not only Carpetho Rusins from the United States and Canada, but there was one person of Jewish background, a survivor of the Holocaust, saved by a Carpetho Rusin family, Canadian businessman, but for five or six years running supported Rusin schools in Transcarpathia. Jewish guy. Uh, support from North America dwindled to zero. We have no more schools. We have, however, made it for the first time to the Ministry of Education of Ukraine. For the first time, we had official meetings 
with representatives of the Ukrainian government never happened before under any previous regime, except with the ombudsman, but that's somebody who you know, works on behalf of human rights. We're talking about officials of the regime. So we met with the, the Ministry of Education, and we're working, the other demand that we're now working on uh, is to create a department of Carpathia Rusin studies at uh, Ushorod State, at Ushorod National University. Uh, and all of these processes, as you can imagine, are long involved, but these are, these are our primary goals at the moment, cultural goals. Recognition of the nationality, Carpathia Rusin's at the national level, support for education in particular, uh, by hopefully convincing the Ministry of Education to introduce into the normal school program Carpathia Rusin elements. And then most importantly, uh, to create a department at Ushurud uh, National University. So let me stop here.